All right, turn in your King James Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm going to look at the subject today of don't put your faith in Christians. Your faith is supposed to be in Jesus Christ. And a lot of times Christians will fail because they look at other Christians. They don't look to the author and finisher of their faith, Jesus Christ. They, look, they don't look to a perfect man, they look to imperfect people. And as a result, other people fail and they start to lose faith in what Christians are supposed to be and whatever else. There's an ideal there, definitely. Um, the scriptures are very clear as to what you're supposed to do as a Christian, how you're supposed to live, how you're supposed to talk, whatever. Um, and Christians fall short of that many times. And if you're looking at other Christians and you have friends in the faith and whatever else, um, again, you got to understand we're in the falling away right now. And it's, you know, the falling away, it doesn't, well, it kind of gets bad and then it kind of gets, just kind of levels out and then it gets a little bit bad and a little bit better. You know, no, it's, it's constantly going down. It gets worse with time. And so what I'm saying is this study is going to be about showing you the scriptures that prove that it's between you and Jesus Christ first and foremost. And what is your responsibility to the body of Christ? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Why didn't Paul do that? Because then the people would start to worship him. Um, a lot of these big-name preachers of the past, unfortunately, you start to look into their lives and things, and you start to see some problems. Um, I remember hearing, you know, not hearing, I read the book about Sam Jones, uh, written by his wife, and uh, she talked about how he was a high-level Mason, Freemason, I think the Shriners or whatever, he was a, I think it was a Knights Templar or something like that that he was part of, but the Shriners were, I think, at his funeral and whatever else. The guy was a Freemason, and um, there was a woman that was so distraught at the viewing when he died that she actually went into, you know, started hyperventilating and died right there, you know, at the funeral. Um, that's a problem. That's somebody that's worshiping a man that professed to be a Christian. Right? Not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to say, oh, look at me. And I mean, Paul had the education, too. That's the funny part. You can't say, well, Paul was just a, you know uneducated um, fisherman or whatever. No, Paul was educated. He had the ability to impress people with big words and, and you know great speeches and great orations and everything else, and he didn't do it. He just said, let me talk plain. And a lot of you people out there, you get offended at me because I talk plain. But you see, Paul is my example, and I'm, he talked plain, I'm going to talk plain. I want you to know what I'm saying. You understand? Verse 2, For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Uh, well, no, Paul, you should have been there relating to the people, and, and what does so-and-so think of me, and what does, you know, no, he's saying, you know, I'm there for the body of Christ, we'll see this as we continue. But the truth of the matter is, personal relationship with Jesus Christ, um, irrespective of your feelings. My relationship to Jesus Christ comes first. Your relationship to Jesus Christ had better come first. Verse 3, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Yeah, a real preacher, God will show them things out of this book. And I'll tell you what, it is amazing, the fellowship of the Spirit among the body of Christ. There has been so many times where I've been preparing a sermon, I have the sermon notes on my desk, writing them out, and I get on YouTube here and I look at the comments of other videos and somebody says, hey brother, I'm looking at this passage in the book of Luke or something, and I'm looking down at my notes saying, okay, I have things in Luke. And, you know, passage of Luke here I'm looking at. And they say, did you ever think about, you know, no name some verse and does this mean what I think it means or whatever? And I'm looking and I'm thinking, that's exactly what my sermon would say. And how many times I've brought out sermons and it's the reverse of it. I'll hear, I bring out a sermon and somebody says, boy, this is weird. It's like you're reading my mind. It's, it's exactly what the Lord was showing me in my, in my devotions this past week. You know, whatever. It's the fellowship of the Spirit, you see. And that's beautiful. That's wonderful. We're supposed to have that as Christians. And again, people get all upset at me. They say, Brian Nellinger's against church buildings. Yes, I am. They say, so then he doesn't believe Christians should meet together. No, <laughs> that's a lie. Uh, I think it's perfectly fine for Christians to meet together. Just don't follow the pagan ways of the Catholic world to do so. You see? Not that hard to figure out. Fellowshipping with other believers is wonderful. It's a beautiful thing. Um, 
you got to be careful it doesn't get worldly and you just start talking about the weather and politics or something when you get together. Um, make your fellowship about the Word of God. But the fact of the matter is, when you get right down to it, it doesn't really matter what the other Christians think of you. It matters what Jesus Christ thinks of you. Verse 6. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Okay? So he's not saying, I've learned all this great wisdom, I have all this book knowledge, and I'm going to show it to you. Um, no, it's God that's revealing things. There should be a spirit of revelation there. And again, you know, a lot of my studies, I get, I get called a cult leader and all this other stuff, but a lot of my studies are actually things people have sent to me and said, Do you, are you seeing the same thing? I, I don't have a YouTube channel. I don't have a camera. Could you preach this? And I'll take their notes and I'll preach it. You know, I, I've, I've gotten things from housewives that say, I think the Lord showed me this thing here. And I look and I think, wow, that's really phenomenal. I've gotten things from teenagers. I've gotten things from older people. I mean, I've, the body of Christ gives me a lot of the material that I have. It's not all just me. <laughs> Go to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. I don't know if my phone's going to go over there. It's supposed to have an unlisted number, and, and yet, uh, you know, I get these telemarketers and things that somehow get it. Don't know how that happens. Romans chapter 15, verse 20. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. Hmm. Paul didn't come in and ride the coattails of anybody. He came with a spirit of revelation that God would reveal things through him. All right? Um, again, you're seeing that personal relationship between a saved man and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I mean, it doesn't mean we have to reinvent the wheel or anything here. I mean, we don't have to just go through and say, I can't listen to anybody, no man of God from the past or whatever else, I can't listen. I just have to... Go to the scriptures and, and develop all my doctrine. Uh, no. Um, you know, you should be hearing from different preachers, multiple preachers and things. And as you grow in the Lord, you're going to start to see, oh, brother so-and-so was wrong here. Um, this guy was wrong there. Oh, wow. The Lord's going to show you that stuff. Um, it's just part of growing as a Christian. Right? But uh, if you see that um, you know, I thought Jack Hiles was a great man at one point in time. I preached in a church the one time, and, and, you know, I was so impressed that Jack Hiles actually stood behind this very pulpit, and he put his hands right here, and stupid, you know, kid. Uh, I wasn't really a kid, but, you know, I was in my, you know, late 20s, actually. I wasn't a kid, but my whole point is I was just stupid, stupid. I had no idea, you know. But uh, when I found out that Jack Hiles was into all kinds of corruption, I just became an atheist after that. I just said, you know, forget about it. I just can't trust Christians anymore, or Christianity, if Christians are so corrupt. And, uh, <laughs> no. I found out the guy was crooked, and I said, oh, man. Wow, he deceived me. Boy, that's a shame. And um, a lot of my mentors, a lot of guys that I looked up to very much over the years, as, as I grow in the Lord, I, I look back and I see, you know, oh, yeah, brother so-and-so, he he had some issues. Um, you know, I think very highly of Peter Ruckman. I, I give him credit for a lot of the, the things I've learned, but uh, he wasn't perfect. Far from it. Um, Peter Ruckman did a lot of compromising. He took a lot of stands that he should not have been taking. And um, I have enough grace there yet that I'm not going to come out, you know, saying he was a fraud and whatever else. Uh, no, I don't believe that, but uh, he wasn't perfect. But thankfully, we have a book and a Savior uh, that are perfect. Romans chapter 14. I'm going to read a bunch of verses here. Uh, what I'm trying to get through here to you, brethren, is uh, things are getting worse, okay, um, in this time that we're in, before, leading up to the catching up of the body of Christ. And uh, you can't put your faith in Christians. You really can't. 
Um, I'm thankful for brethren that come along and want to do videos with me and whatever else and have fellowship with and, and whatever else. But I'm going to tell you right now, um, there's not one other Christian on this planet, not one, that's going to affect my relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't care who turns against me or who you know, speaks evil to me or whatever. I don't care. My relationship is with Jesus Christ. I put my faith in Him. Right? And I'm going to show you here. You say, well, then you're just all one-man show or whatever. No, no, no. There's a responsibility there to the body of Christ. But as far as you saying, you know, my, my whole belief system is based on what other Christians are doing, uh, you're setting yourself up for a very, very major fall. Very major fall. Revelation chapter 14, verse 7. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. Absolutely. Um, it's not all about you, okay? It's all about Jesus Christ, first and foremost. But uh, secondly, he put us here. One of the reasons for, you know, our, you know, he doesn't just bring us up as soon as we get saved is we have a ministry of reconciliation to the lost world, but we also have, you know, reproving, rebuking, exhorting the brethren. And that's supposed to be there as well. Verse 8, For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. You see that, that relationship there? It's not about me and you. It's about me and Jesus Christ and you and Jesus Christ. Um, you're not a Denlingerite. You're a Christian. All right? I'm not a Ruckmanite. I said that in jest in one of my old videos, but... You know, was just joking, trying to make fun of the whole people attacking that that whole thing. Oh, you're part of the Ruckmanite cult and all that stuff. Whatever. It's about Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. Verse 9. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the, of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And let me just say this. I've seen this thing of, you know, I'll rebuke some totally wicked false prophet preaching another gospel, the whole thing, and people say, why are you rebuking your brother? And I just think, we both, we, we preach two different gospels. How are we brethren? I, I, I've, it just boggles the mind. I mean, I realize that these people that are saying that are lost. They don't understand things, but, you know, I, I get this thing all the time. You know, you're, you're rebuking, rebuking your brother. They're preaching a different gospel than I preach. How are we brethren? Right? Uh, what's the verse talking about? It's simply saying, hey, take it easy on the brethren. I'm, I mean, I've been saved a long time. The Lord's done a lot, you know, through this ministry, and He's done a lot for me to show me truth. And it'd be rather foolish of me to go back and judge, you know, some new Christian just gets saved, and I see them messing around with the kind of stuff I used to mess around with, you know, way back when. Um, I'm not going to be real harsh on them right away. I'm not going to judge my brother, you see. Um, and if they're messing around with things, well, they're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. They're going to have to give an account. Verse 11, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Verse 12, very key verse here. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Oh, praise the Lord, I got saved. I've escaped the judgment of Almighty God. I'm not going to be judged. Well, that's only partly true. You see, you won't be judged in the fires of hell. You won't pay for your own sins. Jesus paid for your sins. But you will be judged for what you do in this life. You absolutely will be. If you mess around with sin down here in this world, all sin is negative. Every single bit of it. All right? There's no, uh, well, that, there's good sins and there's bad sins. No, they're all bad. And if you mess around with those sins, it's just going to wreck you. You know, bad. And uh, if you mess around with those sins, say it this way. If you're messing around with sin, then you can't be serving the Lord. Just as simple as that. Sin takes you away from Jesus Christ. Therefore, you're going to suffer loss at the judgment seat of Christ. Why? Well, because the time that you're spending watching television, backsliding and watching television, or playing video games, or being sick because you ate junk food, or whatever... That time that you're wasting like that could have been better spent serving the Lord in some way. You know, when the Lord shows you a truth, 
uh, you really should listen. You say, how do you know that, Brian? Uh, because I have the scars to prove what happens when you don't. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm actually one of the biggest idiots you'd ever want to meet when it comes to being saved. Uh, I do some really stupid things. I've had the Lord, you know, put the thought in my head literally a couple times, don't do that. And I go, oh, I'll be all right. And I go to do it and I get hurt. Stupid. Yeah. I'm not perfect. Far from it. And I'm going to, I'm going to give an account for what I've done with my life. And that's why I preach so hard on sin. Verse 13. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Um, you're supposed to judge in the sense of telling somebody, you know, reproving, or rebuking, exhorting. Uh, that's there. But what I'm saying is don't be, don't be real quick to just be boom, nail somebody. I take a long time before I start saying somebody's lost. Unless I see that they're just totally wicked, you know, replacement theology, post-tribber, new version using... The Catholic Church is fine. They're using profanity. They, you know, whatever. If it's obvious, well then, yeah, boom, I'll nail them. If they're preaching a false gospel, there's no repentance or there's no asking God to save you, calling upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Yep, yeah, see ya, you know. Uh, I'll judge somebody very quickly like that. They're false. But uh, if I, I mean, I've, I've had dealings with brethren. Uh, my word, fornication, um, perversion, uh, all kinds of different perversions. And, uh, you know, drunkenness, smoking, um, I mean, you just list the sins. I've, I've had dealings with Christians that are messing around with all that stuff. And I'm real gentle. And I'll, I'll say, well, you know, real, brother, you really shouldn't be doing that. And, you know, laziness, complacency. Um, I'm going to be gentle, as gentle as I can be. I'm not, not going to try to judge you there. But the fact of the matter is, the biggest judgment there is, Self-judgment. Um, you know, judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Um, it, it's so funny because, you know, I'll come out and I'll, I'll attack these people for using profanity in a video or something saying they're not Christians. You know, and they'll say, oh, you know, how would you judge, you know, how, could, how dare you could judge that and whatever. And yet if I stood up in front of the camera and I used some kind of profanity or whatever else it'd be all over the internet people would be cutting that thing out and they'd be putting it all over the internet i mean I've, I've even had people say that i've used profanity in a sermon and yet they never you know provide any proof of it <sighs> kind of weird people lie about me to try and to try and bring me down it's interesting um but the fact of the matter is brethren uh i'll just say it this way there are a lot of things you can do as a christian that aren't going to send you to hell, that aren't going to get you just in total disfellowship with the Lord. But it's best just not to mess with things because you can put a, a stumbling block in somebody else's way. All right? I'll give you a good example. Um, we live debt-free. And is it a sin to get a mortgage? Is it some kind of a unpardonable sin that you're instantly under God's wrath if you get a mortgage or something? No, I don't believe that way. But you see, if I say... I think mortgages are fine and I would recommend getting one if you'd like to get a house or whatever else. Then there's somebody out there that might have a problem with debt and it's constantly in getting more and more and more debt because of covetousness. And then they'll say, well, Brother Brian preaches it's okay to get a mortgage and, and it's okay to get a car loan. and work. So I'm just going to keep on doing it. See? So then I have to take a stand where I say, okay, I don't believe in getting into debt with mortgage or whatever else, you know, don't get into debt with new vehicles either, by the way. That's a terrible investment. Houses are at least a little bit better investment. But you see, so I just take that strong stand. And then people attack me and say that I say, if you have a mortgage, you're going to hell. You know, lost people attack me like that. And I didn't say that. What am I doing? I'm trying to be careful not to put, not to put a stumbling block in my brother's way. Um, I was addicted to video games for many, many years. Uh, a very long time. And I made all kinds of excuses for it, whatever else. I used to um, have a little iPod or whatever else, the, the, the MP3 player. It wasn't an iPad or an iPhone or anything, just an old iPod. And it had a little video game on it. And a lot of times I'd sit there and I'd listen to, you know, Alexander Scorby and I'd play a little video game thing there. And um, my wife came along and she said, you need to quit doing that. 
And I said, well, I'd like to. I've been trying to quit for years. You know, I get irritated with this video game stuff. And she said, you need to quit it. God's going to use you. you. You need to quit that stuff like that. And you need to be careful what you're saying to the brethren out there. Because a lot of brethren, you know, yeah, I mean, you if you have any kind of video game addiction or if you've had it in the past, you understand what I'm talking about. It's one of the biggest wastes of time that there is. And you see, if I come out and I say, I think some video game playing is okay, then people that have video game addiction will go and say, well, he said, Brother Brian said it's okay. So therefore, you see, see, we're very quick to be able to want to compare ourselves among ourselves because you can find somebody else that's a, as big a hypocrite as you are on an issue. Let's just face it. But when you start to compare yourself to Jesus Christ, uh-oh, uh. you say, well, brother, we can't be Jesus Christ. Uh, we're part of his body, aren't we? Um, we're supposed to be the bride of Christ? Paul says about he wants to pre present the body of Christ basically as a chaste virgin. A chaste virgin? Uh, how chaste are you in your life? Ouch. Hmm? Um, be real careful what you say people can do. You know, I, I get a little bit rough on, on certain sins and whatever else because I know people struggle with things. And you don't need to hear some preacher standing up there and saying, you know, uh, well, I do like to play a little bit of, you know, whatever video game once in a while. I don't, I don't do it much, you know, because you're going to do the same thing if you're struggling with that addiction, wasting your time. I mean, how do you think video games are going to show up at the judgment seat of Christ? The Lord's going to be up there and he's going to say, man, that time you could have put together a study, you could have been reading my word. I was really impressed that you, you actually beat that game. Wow. Let's put it on the big screen. I want, I want people to see how good of a gamer you are. I don't think so. I don't think so. Be careful. Verse 14, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. You see what I'm talking about? But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. You know what things you struggle with. I don't have to come to your home and look through and, and examine your life and whatever. The Holy Spirit of God is convicting you right now of whatever it is that you struggle with. And it's not because of my phenomenal preaching and man's wisdom. No, it's because the Holy Spirit, if you're saved, He's in you right now and He's prodding you and He's poking you and saying, that thing needs to go. Isn't He? I'm getting it. I have a terrible time and I've said this in the past, this is one of the, the few remaining things uh, that I struggle with, and that is I have a terrible time with information and, and studying and researching uh, online. Um, and that comes in the, in the way of videos. I learn a lot. I study a lot. Um, but a lot of it is just, okay, you've learned it. Now, get back to the sermon notes. Oh, yeah, but, oh, oh man, I didn't see that video. i got to click on that one. And pretty soon... It's a couple hours of video throughout the day, and I feel tired, and my eyes are hurting, and I'm getting a tension headache, and I'm just thinking, why on earth did I do that? And I remember the, I remember the video game addiction. I remember the covetousness thing of going and, and hey, I get any kind of vehicle I want or whatever else and just get a loan and, and whatever and looking at big houses and more than I could possibly afford, but, hey, if I can get a mortgage, and, and I remember that stuff. Okay, I've never had a mortgage, but I'm saying I've applied for them. I tried to go through with that whole process. And the Lord stopped me. Praise His name. <laughs> but uh, you see, to you it might not be unclean, is what verse uh, 14 is talking about. But to me, the thing I know I struggle with, you know, there's some people out there, you couldn't have a sip of alcohol. You know why? Because you struggled with drunkenness in your past. You know and just one little sip of that, and it's going to be, oh boy, okay, maybe just a little bit more, just a little bit more. Get away from it. To you, you esteem it as an unclean thing. You say, no, no sorry, um, I'm sorry, I can't have any of that. You go to somebody's house, they say, hey, would you like just a little bit of wine? Nope, sorry, can't do it. And again, if you know that, you know, you have some 
buddy that you're counseling or whatever else, and they've had drunkenness in their past, for goodness sake, don't have alcohol around them. All right? And I mean, Christians, I, you know, my stand on the whole alcohol thing is, okay, you know, wine in the Bible is, is, you know, definitely it's fermented. And fermented doesn't mean rotted, by the way. That's another important distinction there. Um, there's a fermentation process. And fermented foods are actually very good for you. They're living foods. They're, there's beneficial bacteria and everything else in them. Um, but my whole contention on the thing is, man, I just don't want to mess with it. Um, I've tried you know, wine, and it tastes like just cough syrup to me. <laughs> I just, and you know, I, I can't imagine drinking so much of it that I would actually get drunk from that. Um, it's not a problem to me, all right? I could have a bottle of wine sitting around and fine, and oh, okay, I'll take a little bit of cough syrup here, you know. But uh, somebody comes over, uh, I don't want them seeing that stuff in my house. Go away. Um, there's other things that uh, are out there in this world and whatever else that I might not struggle with, and there's other things I do struggle with. Keep that stuff away. Again, we're supposed to be sanctifying our lives. You know, I mean, let me ask you a question, very personal, very prying question. Um, are you closer to the Lord? Are you more of a spiritual person? Are you more righteous today than you were a year ago? Have you gotten victory over some sins? You say, oh no, I'm actually a little bit worse. You're going to answer. You're not escaping judgment because you're saved. You're going to be judged. Your position for all of eternity and the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ on the earth, that position is determined on how much you suffer for the Lord in this life. Second Timothy chapter 2 talks about that. What are you doing with your life? Do you have a good work ethic? It's a war, you see. You're fighting against your flesh all the time. Don't fall into the trap of putting your faith in other Christians and saying, well, he did and well, she did and, and I've seen and I know. And What about Jesus? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Hmm. Let's continue. Verse 15. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably, destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. If you know somebody has a problem with something that you don't have a problem with, um, don't do it around them. Okay? Esteem others better than yourself. Verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. You know, it, again, it's something that we struggle with, all of us do, with our flesh, where we say, you know, if I had to give this up, I mean, what am I, I got to give this up and I have to quit doing this and I have to quit doing that, all these sins that I got to give up and think, um, wouldn't it lead to more righteousness, peace and joy? Less sin in your life? And yet our flesh struggles with that. And the lost world will push you on that thing. Oh, holy Joe, oh, goody two-shoes, you know. I'll make fun of you. Oh, you can't do this and you can't do that. Oh, you're such, a, you're such a boring person to be around and whatever else. Oh, they should feel that way. But as a Christian, um, wouldn't it be nice to get to a point where you aren't really messing with sin anymore? And I realize, you know, I'm not talking sinless perfection here, but I'm saying, wouldn't it be nice to have that as an ideal? Uh, one of my wood-turning mentors, mentors that I had was a British man, and, and um, he said that somebody asked him the one time, they said, you know, his, his, the forms of his bowls were just beautiful. I mean, the guy was tremendously talented. And somebody said, what is your secret? You know, what's, what's the whole thing? And he said two things. Um, the way to be a master wood-turner is to make a lot of mistakes and learn from each one. And don't do it again. And number two, I strive for perfection every time I put a piece of wood on my lathe and start to turn it. He said, I'll never achieve that perfection. I'll never have the perfect piece. But if I'm always striving for that perfection, I'm always going to do my best. 
And I thought, at the time, I thought, wow, that, wow, such an inspirational artist here for me. Uh, but since I've been saved, I understand that that's actually some really good instruction and righteousness for a Christian. Um, you're going to make mistakes, but learn from them and don't go back to them. And secondly, strive for perfection. Okay? Lord shows you something's wrong, quit it. Stop. You know, right now, I've, I've come to realize there were some things I, you know, natural wild plants and whatever else that I grew up with, and we just ate wild berries and whatever else, but uh, I've come to understand now that there's a whole world out there, let's say it this way, <laughs> whole world out there that looks like that, of just cures and health and, and things that are just, they taste good. This lie that natural health tastes bad or whatever. No, it does not. All right? Just an amazing creation, amazing world out there. And I want to strive to know more about that. And I want less of the processed sugars and, and, and less of the junk food and, and all that other stuff. Why? Strive for perfection. I want to get better and better and better as time goes by. Stronger in my relationship with Jesus Christ. Verse 18, For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. You're sanctifying your life. You're going to be acceptable to God. Why? You're serving Jesus Christ. You're not serving your flesh. I mean, you know, the temptation is going to be there. But the more of that stuff you can get out of your life, the more you can fight that stuff, the more you're, you're, you're sanctifying the vessel that your body is. Verse 19, let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace. I don't do that very often, to be quite frank with you. I like to fight. I still have the competitive edge of, you know, the motocross type of thing I used to do as a teenager and whatever else, where you're trying to cut the other guy off, and if he wrecks, you go, ha, guy, you know, got him. I hope he broke his, his uh, you know, four-wheeler or dirt bike or whatever else, and so he's out of the race, you know. Uh, I still have some of that. I still have some of that pride. He said, well, I didn't think he'd say it. I said it. I still have some serious pride issues. Yeah. I don't always follow after things that make for peace. And, you know, people come after me and whatever else, but, you know, I, I'm trying to, to get to a point where I just say, eh, whatever, you know. <laughs> um, I mean, there's the thing of exposing false prophets, certainly, but there's ways to egg people on and whatever else, and I struggle with that stuff. Verse 19 there, and things wherewith one may edify another. Um, for, meat destroy no, for meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. You know you're going to offend somebody. You know you're going to mess somebody up and whatever else. And you go, oh, I don't care. It's my life. You know, we do have a responsibility to the brethren. And this ministry here is an imperfect ministry. I'll tell you that right now. I've done some stupid things over the years. And uh, a lot of my enemies don't have the same kind of um, honesty. They'll never admit to any kind of mistakes. Verse 21, It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Yeah, I was talking about earlier, the thing of drinking wine. Verse 22, Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Don't have faith in other Christians and things. Don't have just, it's everybody else. And they, they my relationship to God is based upon other people. Mm -mm. Hast thou faith? You, thou, you see? Faith, have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. I, I mean, I can't even really say a lot of the things that, I, that are in my head right now as far as people saying... You know, well, I can play a video game. It's not a big deal or whatever. Maybe not to you, but uh, it could be to somebody else. Be careful what you're doing. You say, I don't have a problem with drinking alcohol. Okay, to yourself, maybe between you and God. But uh, don't mess around with that stuff in front of other people. It can cause a stumbling block, you see. 
And uh, don't part company either, by the way, if some brothers, you know, disagrees with you on that issue or whatever else. Um, be careful. There should be peace there. Verse 23, And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Um, damned in the sense of your life will become pretty bad. Uh, you can really mess up your life as a Christian. And again, I've seen that thing. I've seen brethren that just really, really, really wreck their life. And like I said, I would, I would just have left Christianity a long time ago if it was about people. But it's not about people. It's about your relationship to Jesus Christ. And um, that's what matters. And, you know, unfortunately, I, I'll just say that there's, there's some people out there that I have some serious questions about. And I, I'll have grace, and I'll watch them for a while. Um, but that's one of the big reasons why I don't yoke up with a whole lot of different people in ministry, um, just simply because I want this ministry to be a reflection of what you should be doing in your life. Um, don't point people to yourself. Point people to Jesus Christ and to His Word. Um, I'm not perfect. You're not either. All right, um, But to say that all the people that have ever been in my little circle of friends and whatever else, that we're all perfect and whatever else, and we, it, we just, <laughs> uh, no. We're all sinners saved by grace. Uh, I guess I'm just trying to say be careful um, because I think there's going to be a lot more people falling away as time goes by. And um, I'm careful not to judge certain brethren too harshly uh, but I see like I said I see some people that that I see some issues and that's why I'm doing this study because I want you to remember it's about Jesus Christ and you it's not about other brethren so um, that's going to be it for this study uh, just, just wanted to put this thing together because I see a lot of you. You get it discouraged. You know, you're, you're in you know, some place somewhere, and you're literally the only Bible believing Christian that believes the way you do. And uh, you just, it's so frustrating. You know, and you'll meet somebody that you think is a Christian, and and you get to talking, and all of a sudden that they're acting like a lost person and getting mad at you for telling the truth, and you think, oh no, I thought I found one. <laughs> I know, I understand. Believe me. Uh, it's rough sometimes, but it's about you and Jesus Christ. You got to keep that thing in mind. Uh, so, um, just real quick little thing here. I know a lot of people have been asking, "What did I? What happened to the Ben the Baptist video? This who's the real Ben the Baptist?" Um, one of the primary things, uh, one of my core beliefs, is somebody. Whatever they've done in their lost life, I, and then they say that they have a profession of faith from there on out. I uh, never judge somebody what they did in their lost life, okay? Um, I'll judge them when they say, I've, I've, I've been saved now, I'm saved and whatever else. And from then on, uh, I'm going to judge from that point on whether that salvation was genuine. Um, and... Benjamin Naim wrote me and he said, all that stuff that you dug up, the you know, the Disney student program thing and the Methodist church and a lot of this other stuff, he said, that was all from my lost life. And I thought, well, yeah, you're still lost because you're an Anderson follower and whatever else. But then, you know, I had to have a little bit of grace because I did some really stupid things early on in my salvation. And I don't, he didn't give me a real detailed thing of, of his how he came to, you know, he said he heard the thing about uh, uh, eternal security and whatever else, and I don't know all the details there. Uh, I would say very strongly that the guy's lost right now, definitely, but I will judge him from the point of him saying I got saved and now what he preaches now, and I'll confront him on that stuff. And it would be hypocritical for me to say, um, because he, he simply said, yeah, my real name's Benjamin Nahum. He put it in one of his recent videos, Ben Nahum, actually his, you know, Jewish name there, which he's going to get criticism from the Anderson camp for that, because there's people there that hate Jews, and now if they find out that he is a Jew, well, then, you know, oh boy, 
Jewish ethnicity, I'm saying. But um, I took the video down simply because it goes against one of my core stands that I, that I take. Um, he said, gave his real name, and he said, my stuff that I did in the past was a mistake. Uh, he shouldn't have his LinkedIn profile up or whatever else. Uh, that should be taken down and rewritten. But I am not going to judge the guy's past. I think his conversion was false. But the fact that he said, that stuff in the past was a mistake. I made a mistake back there. Not a problem. Okay. Um, you know, I don't, the source that was given to me, um, I started looking into some of that stuff. And they're, you know, quoting James White and, and the King James Bible, attacking the King James only possession. And they seem Calvinistic and whatever else. So I'm done with that article. I'm not even going to mess with it anymore. So I don't really trust the research that those guys have done. And I mean, I brought out plenty of stuff on Anderson's cult, you know. So uh, anybody that's saved should, shouldn't be following Anderson's cult. Um, but, you know, it just, it's a very, very important thing to me to uh, not go after somebody for what they did before their profession of, of salvation, unless I see that they're continuing in it. Uh, some guy that's a criminal and in and out of jail I won't mention any names, <clears throat> Max Bauer, <clears throat> excuse me, and he's internet stalking and violating uh, orders of protection, you know, uh, whatever you call a thing, uh, not protection from abuse, um, order of protection, I guess you call it, where you're told to stay away from a certain person or whatever else, and he violates that and, and whatever, and then I see him doing the same thing now as a professing Christian, uh, no, I'm going to judge that guy, but, uh, some guy that says, yeah, I was going to liberal church thing and I did the whole Disney thing and whatever else. I didn't know. I was ignorant. And I got saved and now I'm doing this stuff here. Okay, then I'll judge him from that point on. And um, so that's why I took the video down. Um, it was not forcibly taken down or whatever else. Uh, but I have, I have grace for people. I think people, again, you know, it irritates me. People think I have no grace at all for people and whatever else. A lot of my enemies, I put up with them for years and years and years. And I should have spoken out earlier in the whole deal and whatever else. I have grace for people. I really do. Uh, I know what it's like to struggle with sin. And again, that's, that's why I, I take such strong stands in, in many different areas. And people say, well, I don't agree with you, brother. Well, understand the position that I'm in. If I say, well, and I give a little bit of leeway, then... It's a stumbling block to certain people. I know that they're they're dealing with these issues, and they'll fall into something. You know, if I say um, I wouldn't do, uh, you know, I wouldn't watch sports on television or whatever, but motorsports, that's a different sp story. Well, then some guy's coveting some sports car or whatever else, or dirt bikes or whatever for just covetousness' sake. He's going to get into that. You see. And he's going to start watching ESPN and he's going to start getting into, you know, all this stuff. That's why I have to say, yeah, just stay away from that stuff. Just stay away from sports and watching television and whatever else. Um, there are some things that are issues of liberty. I understand that. But as a preacher in this unique position I'm in, I have to be very careful about what I say. And, you know, I just, I need to explain that. And, um... I need to explain that, that uh, like I said, this ministry is a reflection of what I try to get across to you, to each of you. Uh, your personal relationship with Jesus Christ is what it's all about. And, um, I mean, I fully expect that there's going to be more people that turn against me in the future um, that come out that they were fakes or whatever else. Uh, I mean, I've, I've had brethren where we've disagreed and we parted company. It's kind of a Paul and Barnabas type of thing. You know, contention's very sharp, and we go our separate ways. But I look into the, what they're doing and whatever else a year or two later down the road, they still have the same beliefs that, that they had when they were a friend of mine, a uh, partner in ministry or whatever else. And others, I've seen that they come along and it's, oh, brother, you know, I love your ministry and I, I love your videos and I've learned so much and all that. And then I say something wrong and whatever else, and they go, whew, and they turn and they change their stand on salvation. They change their stand on the Bible version issue. They change their stand on all these different things. And I think, wait a second here. 
See, that's the difference here. It's not brethren having dis disagreements. It's somebody that's a fake. They're a fraud. They're playing Christian up until a certain point where they get kicked in a way that they don't like, and then they change all of their doctrinal stance. So, just wanted to get that thing across to you. Um, don't put your faith in Christians. Okay, Christians are failures, and I'll include myself in that. It's a struggle. It really is. Um, your faith is in Jesus Christ. And when the Lord shows you something, change. Okay? Uh, he's not going to take good things away from you. He wants to give you more. And, and you know, things are going to lead to more righteousness and peace and joy. And you just can't get that from the things of this world. Okay? Uh, like the old hymn says, you know, stand up for Jesus. And it says... The arm of flesh will fail you. Ye dare not trust your own. Your own? Yeah. The arm of flesh will fail you. Uh, there are Christians that have to step down from ministry for a while because they're failing. Uh, there's some issue in their life that they didn't, they haven't gotten it covered and whatever else. They're not getting any victory over that sin, and they're failing. And they make a rotten, miserable mess of their life. And uh, if you look into that stuff, uh, they will. their failures are going to tear you down. And you just have to say, well, sorry to hear about that brother, sister, so-and-so. be praying for you, but uh, Jesus Christ wants me to do something with my life. Okay? So thank you to everybody out there that prays for the ministry. And um, I guess we'll see you in the next video.